What's happening this week on Art Rocks? A South Louisiana artist also remembered as a chronicler of Cajun culture. Keeping the heat turned up in a musical talent incubator. The wisdom of a basketball coach explored through drama. And a jewel of an historic church still standing tall in Ascension Parish. That's what's in store next on Art Rocks. Support for this program is provided by Georgia Pacific Port Hudson Operations. Like the impulse that drives an artist's creativity, Georgia Pacific's 850 Louisiana employees are driven to produce quality paper products for your home and business. With additional support from the Renaissance Baton Rouge Hotel, centrally located for business and pleasure travel, the Renaissance offers intrigue style and southern hospitality. And by the Watermark Baton Rouge, Art, history, and commerce come together in the heart of downtown Baton Rouge at the Watermark, located in the historic Louisiana Trust and Savings Bank building. And by Prescience Point Capital Management, a fact-based private investment manager using forensic investigation to benefit clients. Research with impact. And by Ann Conley Fine Art, with the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. Hello. I'm James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads magazine. Pen and ink drawings by Louisiana artist Floyd Sonnier display a quiet genius for capturing the essence of Acadiana's people, places and things. As he drew, Sonnier had a passion for documenting rural life in the Acadiana parishes where he grew up. Sonnier, who is sometimes still known as the artist of the Cajuns, passed away in 2002, but his work lives on in many homes and businesses including his gallery in Scott, Louisiana, where Floyd's wife Verley continues to tell the stories behind his work. Well, I grew up on a sharecropper's farm in Acadia Parish in an area called Point Noir, which means Black Point. He started drawing with charcoal that he collected from under the big black iron pots that were used on the farm for boucheries, making soap, washing work clothes. And he had a little cigar box that he would keep his charcoal in and draw life-size animals on the walls in the barn and under his mother's kitchen table on every little brick on the fireplace. He just loved to draw throughout his life. Then he went to the University of Lafayette, which was USL. He actually majored in commercial art. Now I think it's graphic arts. He redesigned Evangeline Maid. He made her more modern. Her skirt was shorter. He redesigned at, when he was working as a commercial artist. There's also a rice company, Cajun Country Rice, that has one of his drawings on their bag, which is in every store in South Louisiana. And the drawing on that bag is our son, Mark, playing the accordion. He always said he wanted to be considered a historian as well as an artist. He loved his Cajun culture. He loved the French language. He loved the customs. He loved the music. He wanted people to understand how he felt by doing his drawings. He was pretty much appointed unofficially as an ambassador. The way Floyd grew up was anything but a plantation life. He was one of 57 first cousins. His dad was one of 10 children, and they all lived in the same area. They lived the same way. They were all sharecroppers. They didn't have electricity. 
until Floyd was a teenager. So he experienced life studying with a lamp. The barn was a major influence in his life. They spent a lot of time in the barn playing, working, working with animals. They spent a lot of time helping their parents. Getting up early in the morning to pick cotton before school, feeding animals. They farmed yams, sweet potatoes, corn. They always did boucheries when it was very cold. And family and friends would gather and help. And everyone would leave with meat, cracklings, boudin, sausage. They shared. The black kettle was used for many things around the farm. What is best known for in Foy's drawings were like boucheries, but they were used to uh, boil work clothes, to make soap. They had many uses. The houses in his drawings are referred to as Cajun houses. They had the steps on the outside, and the reason for that was if they had steps inside their home, they were taxed for having a two-story home. So the story goes that the boys would sleep upstairs and they called it the Le Garçonnier. Boy said Sundays were like recess at school. The kids were playing in the pastures. They made up games, plays. They would all gather at his grandparents' home on Sunday afternoons. The boys would get together and they would just spend time in the woods. They would play marbles. They went frogging. That was at night they had to do the frogging. They hunted, they fished. Boyd has a drawing he did of uh, little boys playing leapfrog. That was a big thing when he was growing up. Music meant a lot to him. He loved his Cajun music. He especially liked Ira Lejeune, a musician that lived not very far from where they were from. And Ira Lejeune is now a legend in many countries. He did a lot of drawings of Ira, probably more of Ira than any other character he ever did in a drawing. Mardi Gras is much bigger now than it was then. The way Mardi Gras was then, when Floyd was growing up, was the way it originally was started. The Mardi Gras would ride through the countryside collecting ingredients for a gumbo. They would stop at each home and perform and ask for gumbo ingredients. In Floyd's Mardi Gras drawings, you often see a chicken running away. Well, that chicken doesn't want to be in the gumbo. That was the reason for the Mardi Gras, and that's the way Floyd experienced it. It's been 16 years since Floyd passed away. There's still so much interest in his work. We get visitors from France, England, Canada, and here in his native home. We were approached two years ago to allow Ballet Acadiana to use Floyd's artwork and his life is portrayed in his book from Small Bits of Charcoal to be used in a ballet. After working with them, the ballet was produced using Cajun music, Floyd's artwork, and his life. They actually went through his book and picked up the stories, making soap, doing Mardi Gras, washing clothes, all the things they did on the sharecropper's farm and they made it look like it was fun. The name of the ballet is Le Papillon, which means butterfly in French. Floyd actually put a little butterfly in each drawing, and to him it symbolized the rebirth of the Acadian culture. Here in Louisiana, there's no excuse for being bored because our state is always alive with cultural events and attractions. Here's a list of some cool concerts, exhibits and festivals coming soon to a town near you.
To learn more about these and other events in Louisiana, pick up a copy of Country Roads magazine. Another resource, the Art Rocks website features every episode of the program, so just log on to lpb.org and follow the prompts. Experts will tell you that learning to play a musical instrument exponentially improves a student's performance in other academic subjects. But keeping instruments in the hands of busy, easily distracted kids can be a challenge too. So take a look at how one Southern California school district is going above and beyond by providing an in-house musical instrument repair shop. The Los Angeles Unified School District has one of the largest music programs in the nation. Thousands of students, from elementary through high school, participate in a wide variety of musical groups, like orchestra, marching band, and jazz band. Supporting music and the arts, um, it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer for the common sense that we all want to see people excel. We want them to be connected. We want them to be a part of something that's greater than themselves. I think it's very important to recognize that, you know, music is one of the hooks that keeps kids in school. It's one of the draws of what they're passionate about, what they get excited about, and music, you know, provides that for young people. I tried playing soccer, but I, I never really enjoyed it. I just did it to please my family. I never really had any, anybody to look up to because nobody in my family is into music. So I actually have people to look up to now. I, I, would, look at, I would look up professionals and I would hear their play and then that's what made me, because I would ask my teacher, how can I get that good? Why don't I sound that well? Like, and then he would, all, we, all he would tell me was practice. That's so all you have to do two, is practice. One, two, three. Our school district throughout its lean times has still maintained a commitment towards making sure that we have those instruments there. On top of being able to have kids have access towards music programs. Music builds a student's confidence because it allows them to engage in a process that everyone is not proficient in. Everyone can't speak another language. Everyone can't play a musical instrument. And to be able to um, succeed in that capacity allows students to believe I actually can do this. And when they sense that they can be successful in this area, then you know something? In other areas, I can learn that and be successful in that as well. Not a lot of people do play the tuba. They might play an instrument, but they don't choose the tuba because the tuba is like, I feel it's all, I always feel like it's underrated. Being the, actually one of the only, one, only tuba players to come out of Jefferson and to actually play Jefferson, it made me feel pretty proud because I, I could say that, you know, I was one of the top dogs there. I was like, I was very, like, very important because without me, there's no band, honestly. But instruments wear out over time, and sometimes there are accidents or rough handling. Sometimes students have a lot more fun with the instrument, and some of that fun might, you know, do some damage to them, but yeah, we do see a, a variety of types of issues and repairs. When instruments require some tender loving care, they end up here, at the district's musical instrument repair shop. Every year, some 8,000 brass, woodwind, or percussion instruments will pass through the shop. The musical instrument repair shop started in the 1960s. The district at the time was pushing music education. We have a large variety of instruments, any, anywhere from your basic flutes, piccolos, to your stand-up basses. When we have these instruments, it's not just that we're making a simple repair. Sometimes these instruments have more value than just learning how to play an instrument. You know, it could affect a student's life in the future, you know, help them in a positive way. And it's very satisfying to, you know, to be part of that. Without providing music for LAUSD children, you wouldn't have classic groups like the Platters, who came out of LAUSD, the Penguins, with the song Earth Angel, 
the coasters. You wouldn't have Will I Am of the Black Eyed Peas. You wouldn't have the Red Hot Chili Peppers or Los Lobos. You wouldn't have these titans in the musical industry who have charted just a forward direction in music without the experience they gained in K-12 education in LAUSD. Any way that we can support, whether it be donating an instrument or working with your schools to help with productions and or to help to just teach our kids, you know, the importance of studying the arts and being a part of the arts and living it is, is uh, crucial. Here's a treat for fans of the arts and college basketball alike. A new production by the Milwaukee Repertory Theatre portrays the life and the wisdom of Al McGuire, the legendary Marquette University head coach who led his team to a national championship in 1977. The stage play was written by McGuire's longtime friend and broadcast partner Dick Enberg and stars Tony Award winner Anthony Cravello. I'm strictly off the cuff. Always have been. I play the moment. Congratulate the temporary. It's very important to not be overprepared in life. There's no way you can be a successful coach if you're not ready to throw out your whole strategy four minutes into the game if you find out you're wrong. There's no pride in being right if you lose. McGuire the Show is a one-man play about Marquette basketball coach Al McGuire, focusing on uh, really his, his biography, the high points, the low points, but really what some of the things that we remember him for. I mean, he's a, a phenomenally unique person with a, a really unique worldview. I always pour my own beer, because I like lots of fun. Shows he's got life. Who wants a flat beer? He's this wonderful sort of poet, philosopher of the streets. In those days, we were warned to never eat before going swimming because you would be guaranteed to cramp up and drop. So I dropped the banana and went in for a long swim. When I get back, the banana's all cooked brown from the hot sun. So I go home, I tell my mom, I cheated myself out of a treat. And she says, Alfie, life ain't always going to get better if you wait. Right now might be the best moment of your life. So eat the banana. Al was a guy who was very, very concerned with uh, notions of balance and happiness and always sort of being being true to yourself first. I recruited all different type of ball players. So long as it was a crack sidewalk, they led me to them. And I recruited them all the same. People, I'm no crusader, but I can honestly say, I never saw color. I only saw character, because that's all I was looking for. We start with him, uh, talk about his first coaching job at Belmont Abbey in North Carolina tiny little church school. But everyone a good Catholic. The Benedictine monks at Randy Abbey, they weren't sure what to make of that. But after we went 24 and 3 in my first year, they were happy to let me do things my way. Then I hear this big opportunity is open up at Marquette University. Respectable program. Been to the tournament a couple of times but I didn't even know where Milwaukee was. I'll then follow him you know, through getting the job at Marquette to having success at Marquette. Maybe you could say Marquette University owes me a lot for all I've done for the team in the school. And you'd probably be right. But whatever I've done for them, I owe them even more. And then the retirement and ultimately his post-playing broadcasting career, especially through his partnership with Dick Enberg and Billy Packer. So the game begins and I push my button and the right leg goes on in front of Dixie and Billy sitting courtside on press row. So now Dixie says, let's go to Al McGuire. And I would talk into this camera while sitting next to a radiator and a paper towel dispenser with my voice on the toilet while my voice is bouncing off the walls like I'm coming from the bowels of San Quentin. <laughs> Dick Enberg wrote it, which is a really great hook. We're about 20 minutes more material now than the original version and looking for a, a little more dramatic shape, I think, than there was in the original version. Dick himself will say that the first version was really more, a, more an hour-long tribute to Al. We went 97 and 27 in my first five years. When he died, I started writing down all the wonderful life lessons that he had taught me. And finally I realized with all the material, there's a play here. This man is worthy uh, of a play, a one-man, one-act play. And the joy for me 
is, and I've seen almost every performance, is that he comes to life. You know, he was bigger than life uh, before death, and he comes to life again on stage. I play hard nose, and hard nose is Midwest basketball. Of course I know how to recruit, and I'll prove it with my first recruit, Hank Raymond's. And I don't ever worry about the other team. All I care about is what my guys are going to do to them. The stars sort of aligned to have Anthony Crivello play Al. Tony's a Milwaukee guy originally, grew up here, actually went to Marquette while Al was there. I was a student uh, at Marquette for between 1974 and 1976 and uh, wound up being captain of the squad and because of all of that I had interaction with, uh, with Al. You know, so I was able to be, by being a cheerleader, I was on the sideline, I saw all that behavior, I had conversations with him. Who knew <laughs> that many years later, here I am, you know, playing the, the icon that, that I admired as a kid. We don't even have a foul shot yet! These other guys are relatives! Tony is such a, a versatile, facile, emotional actor. The way that he is, is able to explore and express Al's full humanity, for me, is really what makes the thing worth watching. You're taking everything else from me tonight! Eighty-five percent of the script are direct quotes from Al. Did you know that no is sometimes a good answer? Yes, it's the best answer. But the worst answer is no. It's maybe. Because maybe puts you off. I'm not trying to do an impersonation of Al McGuire. We want to get the essence of who he is and bring that forward on the stage. For my final confession, I'm going to need a deaf priest. I violated almost all the Ten Commandments about a hundred times, but I didn't kill nobody. Al McGuire saw life and saw it in a different angle than the rest of us, and, and that again was uh, part of way, what it made him so appealing. You know what else is healthy? Taking a right turn. Perhaps the most important is take a right-hand turn in life, and Al really subscribed to that, that don't always go the same way. Take a chance and go or right instead of always left, and, and let the unplanned, the unexpected come to you. And I, th I think there's application uh, for that for all of us. Congratulate the temporary. Eat the banana. All I'm saying is, go out and meet the guy with the two teeth missing and wearing the ratty pants. You'd be surprised how beautiful the unplanned can be. People still, when you say Al McGuire, they think Milwaukee, they think Marquette, they think of this crazy character who saw the game in a different way. Shout, scream. That's my kind of coaching. That's my world of verbal violence. A lot of people don't understand how it could be like that at a Catholic college. But just because you're religious don't mean you're not tough. Interesting facets to uh, Alfred Emmanuel McGuire. It all gets down to love. If we have love, we'll be good. Stepping back into the boot now for our Louisiana Treasures segment. In Donaldsonville Ascension Parish stands a lovely old church that was built for the black community just a few years after the end of the Civil War. Fortunately, parishioners at St. Peter's Methodist Episcopal have done little to change the look of the church inside or out since it was built. Tanya Williams has researched the history that runs deep here. St. Peter United Methodist Church, which was formerly known as St. Peter Methodist Episcopal Church, was built in 1866 by the Freedmen's Aid Society, which was a Methodist Episcopal Society out of New York. It was during a reconstructive time, so basically that society came down with a mission to set up schools and churches for free black people. The church was built in 1866, so now the church is 152 years old this year. When you pull up, you just see this magnificent historical structure. And the thing I love about St. Peter is when you walk in and you can tell how old it is. You can get a sense of how long we've been here and how stable we've been here. I'm very humbled to be a member of this church. You can notice our stained glass windows. They're very unique and old here. Also, you can see our paneling, which in the 1970s was updated, but actually behind this paneling, you see our original wall structure that we had here. And then go along with the Victorian style, you see all the intricate shapes and details cut throughout the woodwork in here at the church. Here on our benches, you'll see we have shields carved on the side. Also, everything, all of our furniture in here is wooden, which is cognizant to that time. Everything from our benches and our altar where we worship and also our communion panels here, everything is wood, everything. And old, but it's good wood, it's still holding up.
The crystal chandeliers are original to the church. The architecture style here is Greek Revival or Victorian style, which was really popular in England in the early 1860s. Since John Wesley, who was from England, he migrated here in the early 1700s. That Victorian style, he brought that here. And so you're gonna see a lot of the Methodist churches built during that time has the same style. We face financial challenges as far as the upkeep is very expensive with the old materials, you know, replacing the materials and also finding the, the skilled people to come here and be able to work on such an old structure. Now we have had two movies used because of the age of the church. I don't know if you've seen All the King's Men and also The Curious Case of Benjamin Buttons was filmed here. We get a little funny, and as we get funny, we do do maintenance and upkeep as much as possible, but it is difficult to, you know, um, get funding and find the skilled people to work on the church. When I come here to St. Peter, it's like I feel the history of it because I know the membership that was here and the prominent members who attended the church. It also, to me, stands for prominence and permanence because this church has been here a very long time. We've had several prominent members attend St. Peter. One of our trustees here was Pierre Calis Landry. He was born at a plantation home not far from here. And he was the first African-American mayor here in the city of Donaldsonville in 1868. And it's said that he was the first African-American mayor in the United States. He was also an attorney. Um, he also helped found Dillard University in New Orleans. He was also appointed Postmaster General here. He was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives and the Senate, so Pierre Landry is definitely one of our prominent members here. Pierre Landry was a pastor here as well. Another prominent member was J. Sidney Brazer, and he was our local pharmacist. Our lay leader, Brother Israel Williams, he went into our attic and we uncovered and unearthed all these ledgers and we had a trustee committee who actually took minutes at all the trustee board meetings. And so one of the ledgers dates back to 1891. I like to say that they were actually educated on a plantation. Um, maybe the master didn't know we knew how to read and write, but we did. And so I think after slavery was slavery officially ended and they started to go into the schools and the churches, that they were able to bring that skill with them. The church served a dual purpose. We had a place of worship in the front, and then we also had in the annex a school called Hartzell Academy. And that is that for this edition of Art Rocks. But don't despair, you can always find episodes of the show at lpb.org slash artrocks. And if you want more, Country Roads Magazine makes another great place for finding out more about what's going on in the arts all across the state. So until next week, I'm James Fox Smith, and thank you for watching.